Welcome, Impactful Parents. Today, I'm going to talk about why your teenager drives you crazy and how you can cultivate a better connection, and then tips for preparing your child to leave the nest. Hello, my name is Christina Cabos. I'm founder of The Impactful Parent, and I help parents of school-age children turn their chaos into connection with their adolescent. I offer parent education videos every week, online courses, and coaching. And if that wasn't enough, I bring experts in on other fields onto the Impactful Parent stage to teach you even more. And today I have a special guest. Her name is Colleen O'Grady. And Colleen is a licensed therapist and a life coach who helps moms reduce trauma, reclaim their lives, and connect with their children. And after being a mom in the trenches with her own teenage daughter herself, she published her best-selling book called Dial Down the Drama, Reducing Conflict and Reconnecting with Your Teenage Daughter, a guide for mothers everywhere. And she has a new book out, which is Dial Up the Dream, Make Your Daughter's Journey to Adulthood the Best for Both of You. And I'm very happy to have her on the show today to talk about how we can bring out the best in our daughters. So I'm very excited to have you. Thank you for being here. Oh, I'm so glad to be here. I'd love to start off with your story because parents love a relatable story. And <laughs> I know that your book has this kind of background. So tell us more about the relationship that you had with your daughter and why you wrote the book. I was a youth minister for 10 years and teens thought I was the coolest thing ever. I mean, I was cool to thousands of teens. And then I became a marriage and family therapist. And so I had really amazing relationships with so many teens, and I wanted to figure out a way to have a good relationship with mine. So do you have some tips for us for maintaining that healthy relationship with your daughter? There are many things that can help us have a great relationship with our daughter, and it's way more than just parenting tips. What I mean by that is understanding the neuroscience. Because if we understand the neuroscience, one, we don't take things personally. We know so much of the stuff that just drives us nuts is science. Our teens are going to be imperfect. They're going to, their emotions are going to be all over the place. So that's one thing. And that they live mostly in the lower part of the brain, which is the reactive part of the brain. That's where they spend the majority, majority of the time. Another thing is that moms are completely exhausted because we are very busy. And we talked for a second before we started this and we said, we are so busy and we're busy from morning to night. And so we live in a busy culture and we have this pressure to kind of get everything right and be superstars and everything. And then, so what happens is we don't intentionally do this because we're smart enough to know that we're supposed to take care of our health and, you know, because that's all part of the package, but things that normally keep us anchored, we kind of push them back a little bit. I was talking to a pediatrician in my practice. And so I said, you know, so what do you do? Do you exercise? And she goes, well, of course. Yeah. I mean, I do yoga three times a week and I run three, you know, three times a week. And then she did this thing that was this classic is she kind of cocked her head and she said, you know, but I haven't done that for months. And so a lot of times our own self-care gets kind of bumped because we need, we put all the needs of our family and work and everybody else ahead of our own. So here's what happens. We are spent. And then we have a teen that is hardwired to be really dramatic. And that combo of us being spent in a dramatic teen can turn into lots of drama, which is why I wrote the book, Dial Down the Drama. So if we see that it is not selfish to pay attention to ourselves, but it is crucial to pay attention to ourselves because we are the model for our teens. It's not like we're going, we're engineering a perfect teen. They're watching us. So if we are taking care of ourselves, this is such good news for moms. Like when you, I'm giving you complete permission to take amazing care of yourself 
Because when you do that, your teen can be as grumpy as possible. They can give you the eye roll 30 times. They can just push every single button, but you have the reserves to not react. So, so important. Um, even speaking from experience, um, before I was divorced, I was married for 13 years and with my four children. And I was in the mode of taking care of everybody and just doing all the things for everybody else that when I did get a divorce and I found myself alone and crying in my closet, as I like to say, because the closet is my safe space to like throw out all my emotions and my kids can't, you know, see. And if you're a parent, you know what I'm talking about. It's that place in your house where you go and hide or go talk to your girlfriend so nobody can hear you. Sometimes it's the bathroom, whatever. Mine's the closet. So when I find myself uh, in the closet and I'm crying and I'm alone, I'm feeling very lonely because, you know, I'm now a now single mom and that was a new huge transition. I literally looked at myself in the mirror and did not recognize who I was. I was like, whoa, what happened to Christina? She was there the last time I looked and all of a sudden I don't see her anymore. And I was completely lost. I lost myself in motherhood is what I like to say. Um, and that taking care of yourself was step one in trying to rebuild who I was again. And I found that through that process of taking care of myself, I really did become a better mother. Um, and I was a great mom before. I mean, I would love to say I was a good mom before, but I was even better when my tank was full. Just like you're saying, it's just so important. And at the time I had emerging teenagers and they were very, very difficult at the time too, because, you know, big transitions and all the things. And um, I absolutely had to do that in order to, to be there for them. And it, had I not taken care of myself, the whole family unit probably would have just collapsed because you're only as strong as your weakest link in a lot of ways. And, and honestly, I think sometimes we don't like to look in the mirror and say, I might be a weak link right now because I don't take care of myself. And that's a really mm -hmm. hard discovery to do. But I do feel like um, I always tell that story. Just, I want to reiterate your point of how important it is and how effective taking care of yourself can be just yes. to make you a better mother. Yes. Um, so very powerful. Another thing is that we fall into this trap of being a 24-7 monitor. Because we don't have time and we're trying to be efficient, we are... We walk, you know, we wake up and say, okay, you need to have your breakfast. You need to do your homework. We need to leave. And then when they come home from school, you need to start your homework. Give me your phone. And if that's the only connection that we have with our team, like they don't want to hang out with us. So you want to be intentional to take off that monitor hat for at least 20 minutes a day where you're up to nothing about except being present and enjoying them. We so need to be intentional in how we should connect with our kids. I, I like to say that a monitor is really not a relationship. It's a monologue because it's what we're saying to them. And so when I'm speaking to groups of moms, I'll, I kind of play with them a little bit and I'll pick out you know, someone in the audience and I'll say, now, how would you feel if we went to lunch and I said, like, what's up with your hair? Like, you know, that's like too much mascara. You know, that shirt doesn't look good on you. And why are you eating a dessert? Like that mom wouldn't, or that person or friend would not ever want to have lunch with us again. But often we treat our kids that way. And then we think they should say, thank you, mom. Thank you so much. But, but what they do is they hide in their rooms. As you would when somebody's <laughs> critical of you, of course you would hide from that person, right? I mean, it's it's um again really hard to look in the mirror sometimes and and analyze our own behaviors and say, what this this might be because of me, um, not maybe totally because we, there's always parts for everybody to take the you know we don't want to point mm -hmm. fingers and take the blame, but it's just so hard. 
again, to look in that mirror and say, <laughs> I might have a part in why this is going downhill. <laughs> and I laugh. I, and I know it's so hard and apologies are so powerful when a mom gives an apology. And what I tell moms about that is, you know, own your 0.01%. Like, you know, we may not want to own, like, it's not a 50%. But if we have a 0.01%, if we apologize for that, then what I noticed when I did that with my own daughter, then she would own her stuff right after I said that. It's modeling. Um, mm -hmm. It goes back to that kids do not necessarily do what you say, but they certainly model what you do. And mm -hmm. um, that's so important. Yeah. Now, I know you have a specialty in that junior, senior year. And as we prepare for our daughters to leave the nest. Yes. So how do you get the most out of your child's junior and senior years? I'm going to answer that question in a roundabout way. So I asked a bunch of my moms who had kids in college, I said, like, if you could do it differently, what would you do differently like that junior, senior year? And um, it was so enlightening because none of it was, you know, I would be on them to do their homework and I would be on them to do their college applications. I would be on them, you know, to be serious and, you know, make a good application or resume for college. It was none of that. I think one person summed it up perfectly. She said, I would have spent way more time connecting and less time correcting. And what I would say is those those ordinary moments where you're just hanging out and it's like not doing anything spectacular, but you know, for me and my daughter, it was laying on the bed when I was tired and she was done with homework and she'd throw the schnauzer on the bed and she want to show me some videos and we'd start laughing and then she'd start telling stories. And, you know, those are the times that you miss, but that's, the, the trap, I think, in those junior, senior years is there is so much pressure around making good grades and getting into college. And I call that the college trap. And the college trap is you're so intense about that, that you don't see them as you don't see your teen as a human being. You, you don't see that they're stressed, too. You are just on that future focus, like they've got to get into college, they will thank me later. But you're missing out on half of the years of high school, you're missing out on that potential for relationship. I hope that society in general has learned to slow down and enjoy those special moments now that we are post COVID. Um, I could not be more grateful that COVID brought my own family and parenting together. And it just happened to be during my son's senior year and um, my other mm. sons also like that junior merging into senior year too. Like, yes. so they were in high school and although it was, I would never wish it again upon them because they missed out on so much because of everything being shut down and things, yes. you know, like all those big things that are just so important to a teenager from yeah. graduations, all the social events. Like I would never wish that upon them again, but to look on the bright side, it, mm -hmm. it really did slow me down and do exactly what you're just saying and really sit there and just be with my kids because there was nothing else to do. <laughs> but, you know, sometimes you need a catastrophe to happen to freaking hit you in the head so that you can wake up and be a better parent. And mm -hmm. I mean, that's just part of life sometimes. And you can, you can look at the tragedy or you can look at the benefit of the tragedy. And I choose to be an optimist. So <laughs> yes, no, I think that's great. I'd like to go back and ask you a question about some of the neuroscience that you were talking about, mm -hmm. where you said, you know, we should kind of learn more about that so that we don't take things personal. 
And then in addition, I know in your book, you talk a little bit about a maturity gap. And Mm -hmm. so can you explain exactly what is the maturity gap and what other things should we keep on our radar about the brain that we need to know about our kids? So many, so many great things to to learn. But one of some, some fun facts is that the two-year-old and the 12-year-old have something in common. So if your 12-year-old seems to act like a two-year-old, <laughs> there's a reason. And that is because they're, there's such incredible brain activity. The neurons are blossoming and that can be overstimulating, which is why they can be very moody. And so the part of the brain that is developed in teens is this kind of reactive part of the brain, the, the emotional part of the brain. And that tends to see things in very black and white terms. So if you ever heard a teen say, oh my God, all my, all my friends hate me, all the teachers are mean, you know, it's like really black and white. Also, this prefrontal cortex, people have heard that a million times, but they don't know how to, why, how that applies to them. So what that means or how that impacts, you know, in those teen years is that you don't see perspective. You don't see cause and effect. You don't think about long-term consequences you're pretty impulsive. So you kind of think in terms of black and white, you're impulsive, you don't think about consequences, you can see how this can drive parents nuts. So the maturity gap, here's what's confusing. When our teens turn 18, they tell you things like, I'm an adult, you can't tell me what to do, right? Yeah, of course they do. <laughs> yes. And and why do they say that? Well, because they have all these legal rights. There's tons of legal rights. They can be sued. They can have an apartment. The, they can have their little body piercings, all these things. So, I mean, there's like, there's a list of like 10 to 12 things that they they can have as legal adults. But, so, but they're emotionally immature. So what I the maturity gap is that they are physically mature. They're cognitively mature. And so you see that they look like adults. They're amazing, you know, academically plus emotional immaturity. And so when I did the research for Dollop the Dream, what I was hoping to find was at age 18, this is what the brain could do. And this, at age 22, this is what the brain could do. And it was very nebulous, which this is why I wrote this book. It's like, like moms, we know this. Like we'll see, like you're doing so amazing in this one area, and then you made this really impulsive decision. Like what were you thinking? And if you think about it, why are all those college movies, the drunk big party bashes, you know, like those are consistent in every generation. So what that means is that um, I think a good metaphor about it is remodeling a house. So when a house is first being remodeled, it's a complete mess. But then you know, you get the kitchen done and you get the living room done and you get everything pretty much done. But then there's just some wiring that isn't complete. So that is kind of what it's like from 18 to 25. So one of the things that's not complete when when I say the wiring is these neural pathways. And there is a, a, a film called myelin that covers some of these neural pathways. So to I, I understand science through metaphor. So, so these different brain regions are connected by these neural pathways. So this reactive part of the brain um, 
It's also where the reward center of the brain is. So let's let's have a little example. And it's faster than it. So we get information faster than the higher cortex. So a girl is in college and she sees a guy and he's hot and he says, hey, do you want to come in my room? So the reward center is like, yeah. And now the part of the brain that would say, is that a good idea? So morality and rational thinking, of course, is up here in the cortex. So when, so for what's happening is as this brain is developing, it's like at first there are like dirt roads with potholes in it. So these neural pathways are going really, really slow up to the cortex where it's saying, is this a good idea? And so by the time it finally goes, well, is that a good idea? I mean, I know it's not a good idea, but before you know it, and this is the impulsivity, they're in the room. And then later they think, oh, that wasn't a good idea. I think we've been there. <laughs> a lot of people, we've been there. We remember. Yeah. <laughs> Right. So this is not a diagnosis. This is just that immaturity. Mm -hmm. And I think it's very difficult for us as parents so many times to look at our kids as immature when they look like adults. They, they half the time they act like adults. They talk like an adult. And then we have these expectations that you should be more adulty. <laughs> and right. then we get mad when they our kids don't meet those expectations because mm -hmm. their frontal cortex gets in the way and they make these stupid choices and these stupid decisions. And we're like, why did you do that? You should right. know better. Right. Um, but really they shouldn't know better. They're just, they're still learning. They're going through the process. Uh, yes. But it's so difficult for parents to, to separate what they see and what they know. <laughs> So I think understanding the science, especially, I mean, for sure through the teenage years, but also as they are in college and kind of these emerging young adult years is we still have a role to play and it can be really kind of confusing what that is. It's definitely not monitoring them. It's not controlling them, but we still have a role because they'll call us. They'll come home. You have a 20 year old, you know, it's just, um, and we can still speak into their lives. So at that point, our role shifts and how would you label that role? If you're going from parent to what is this next role in your perspective? What is that called? But what you're letting go of definitely is the monitoring and really monitoring is managing because the developmental stage for the teen who goes to college is they need to learn how to self-manage. We let go of managing them. And hopefully it's a process over the tween teen years so that they're managing more and more and more because you want them to be able to, when they're out on their own, self-manage. So that's, that's again about in terms of the junior senior year, it's not just grades. It's like, can they get up? Can they make phone calls? Can they manage their time? Can they manage their stress? All of those, can they manage relationships? Can they manage alcohol? You know, all of the peer pressure. So, so what our role is then is I think is twofold. And one of the things I talk about are the five facets of, of the new connection, which is really about continuing a, secu a secure attachment with the teen so that if they need you, they'll call you or they'll text you or they'll, they'll come back home and stay for a day. And so being that home base, that safe place, that, that person that you, that they just know if like if they're having a really hard day, they can just kind of touch base with home and feel stable again. We want to let go of being the monitor and we want to become the consultant. And the consultant, 
basically, let's just make it simple. The consultant talks less and listens more. You know, I, I asked one of my really good friends, like, what's the hardest thing about being a parent of an emerging young adult or from junior, senior on, you know, and she said, keeping your mouth shut, because it is, we just have this mothering urge to tell them what to do all the time. But at this point, a consultant is really helping them figure out how to think for themselves, how to manage their life. Um, I had a, an example of this is I was talking to a mom um, in my practice and her daughter as a freshman, you know, was on a food plan in the dorm, but on this, her second year, she um, was living in an apartment. And so her mom would give her money for food. And then the daughter would call her up and just say, you need to give me more money because it's gone. So this, I was really impressed with how this mother approached it. And she said, well, I'm not going to give you any more money. That should be enough money. So, you know, are you, go what grocery stores are you going to, you know? And so she was doing the, the kid was doing a lot of DoorDash, you know? <laughs> and so um, the mom would ask her, you know, questions to help her become more aware of where her money was going. And had she ever kind of compared prices you know, from Whole Foods to HEB or, you know, different grocery stores. So then the daughter never called her back because she figured it out. Yeah. What a gold nugget that is, though, to see yourself going from that monitor to the consultant. And I think it's beautifully worded. Um, and I just want to point it out again. It, it's an aha moment, I think, for a lot of listeners right now. And yeah. so... It's, it's very powerful. Again, there's so many things within this <laughs> who talking about. It's just, I mean, I wish I could sit here and talk to you for longer <laughs> because, <laughs> because uh, you, you had just a wealth of knowledge and there's so much that we can learn from you, which is exactly why the audience needs to go and check out your books. So if they would like to get more of you, where can <laughs> they find your books and you know, do, do you have any other services that you offer um, that they could go to get more of you from? Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yes, you can get Dial Down the Drama and Dial Up the Dream wherever books are sold. And it's definitely an audible because mothers drive a lot and don't have time to sit down. So you can listen to my book. Um, I also have a podcast, the Power Your Parenting Mom with Teens podcast. And you're welcome to, to listen to that. You can find me on Instagram and Facebook. And um, I have programs. I have my Dial Up the Dream book club and my Power Your Parenting program, which is just getting some moms together. And I'm we go through content and I get to um, coach them. So I love what I do. I hope you can tell that. You can. You can <laughs> definitely. And it's, I hope today's episode brought value to your day. And if you would like to become a more impactful parent, download the Impactful Parent app. The Impactful Parent app is free to download and full of episodes like this one that are going to help you in your parenting journey. So carry help and tips and parenting resources right in your pocket so that you can refer to it most. Plus, when you download the Impactful Parent app, you're also joining a community of like-minded parents that just want to be the best parent they can for their child. So much more is inside the app. You need to check it out and it's free. So go to your app store and just type in Impactful Parent. I'll be there. Or you can go to theimpactfulparent.com and check out the app from there. It's help right in your pocket. So go download it and learn how you can step up your parenting game and become a more impactful parent. But until next time, you got this. I'm just here to help.